Welcome to School Story, where every school has a story waiting to be told. Join two seasoned school administrators as we delve into the heart of educational experiences. Each episode of School Story is a journey through the dynamic world of schooling, uncovering the triumphs, challenges, and untold narratives that shape the lives of students, teachers, and communities. From inspiring success stories to the complexities of modern education, we bring you insightful discussions, expert opinions, and personal anecdotes that illuminate the diverse tapestry of schools today. All right, welcome back to another episode of School Story. I'm Stuart Hudnall. I'm Spencer Campbell. Yeah, we are so excited you guys are with us. And today we're going to be doing a very riveting, exciting episode about, what is it again? Active listening. Sorry, what'd you say? Active listening. Uh, I see what you did there. I see what you did there. Yeah, got you. So Spencer, tell me, what is active listening? So do you want the like official definition or do you want just like my definition? Um, let's hear both because I'm interested to see how they compare. So active listening is a way of listening and responding to another person that improves mutual understanding. It is an important first step to diffuse a situation and seek solutions to problems. I know. Yeah, sorry. So I, for me personally, it's putting everything that I'm thinking and everything that I'm wanting to say away until I've actually heard and double checked and responded and verified that what I'm hearing is correct. Um, what is an it example, true? a story you can give us that illustrates it? So I think one of the important things when we talk about active listening is we can, I mean, we'll get into more details about this, but just as body language. Um, I mean, I've, I've been in important meetings with my supervisor, with teachers where there's something going on and either I myself are distracted or my supervisor is distracted. You can tell because they have their phone, right? Or they're, you know, they're getting text messages or they're thinking about something else. Even myself, sometimes I think the timing of when people want to have conversations is difficult, especially being a school administrator, because you've always got in that eight hour window, uh, you know, 15, 20 different things that you're thinking about. And when they come in, you've got to like put all of those things on quiet mode. And that's really hard to do. And so I think, you know, we'll talk about how to handle this. But I think sometimes, you know, saying, hey, right now is really not a good time. I really want to give you my attention when we talk about this. Let's do this at another time. Um, and, and, and what that looks like, again, is body language is one part of it, right? I mean, there's a whole, I mean, we're going to spend the next half an hour talking about it. But have what you, is it? You? Have you ever worked with somebody that when you are talking to them, you know that they are only focused on you and what you're saying. I there's a few people that I feel like every time I am communicating with them, th- th- I am the only thing that they're thinking about. Now, whether that's the case or not, that's the way they make me feel. And that's to me, that's the truth, right? Whether that's actually happening or not. Um, I know that I am not good at this. And this is one of the reasons that we talked about this and kind of discussed it because actually, I don't know if either of us, either of us are based on some of our other skill sets and I'm not judging you. I'm just saying, um, what about you? Uh, yeah, I, I know some individuals that when you sit with them, they are, they're all in and which is an interesting dichotomy with school admin because at times i feel like even educators in general i feel like the more add or adhd an educator is um oftentimes uh, the better they are just because things are coming at you all the time and you have to be able to jump if you try to stay linear you have a really hard time uh, because nothing is truly linear especially in education dealing with kids and with parents and so what I feel is a benefit in some situations, like you said, isn't always a benefit in these listening situations. Uh, Because when I'm working or talking with somebody, it's really easy for my ADHD brain to just jump on the 70, hundred things that I need to get done or should be getting done or, or my watch is pinging and it's giving me notifications or my, my phone is, and I just, you know, I'm looking at my phone, even though I'm listening, or at least I think I'm listening. So yeah, it is something that I struggle with. And in part, the reason why we wanted to do it for this episode today. But when that person 
you're sitting across from, you know that you have all their attention. It it's a pretty powerful thing, uh, and I think it's especially rare more and more these days because of all the distractions that are around you. Right. Well, and and one of the things uh, it, we can talk about it when we get further in. I have I have three questions that I really like to ask people when we're about to have a conversation about something, and I'll share those kind of as one of my slash like ninja tricks, I guess, if you want. Um, so in this episode, obviously, we're going to be breaking down um, active listening. We're going to you know talk about kind of what this looks like, um, how to do better, um, understanding what active listening is. And then we'll talk about, um, you know, how to do that with um, staff and then mm-hmm. students slash parents. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is a skill, by the way, if you're an administrator, the skill goes beyond the school it goes home to your family, you know, how you listen to your partner, spouse, your kids, um, you know, outside people. I think this even goes into individual relationships that are just like one time things, right? Whether you're at the supermarket or at the gas station or, you know, getting on an airplane, those small interactions that you have with people. Um, I think active listening goes a long way to develop trust and create positive relationships. So Absolutely. anyway. Absolutely. Hundred percent. So let's jump in. Um, tell me the last time that you were talking with someone and you could tell that they were active listening. Can you think of that? Putting you on the spot. You weren't ready for this. Yeah, I think. Um, so I mean, I'll give you an example. Um, this is one of my kids, one of my own sons is is going through a difficult time right now he's got just a bunch of stuff going on uh it says he's a freshman he's new to high school he's playing high school sports is there's just he's got a job there's you know as a sweeper there's just a lot of stuff going on and uh he he made a comment in a text message thread that was pretty flippant i mean as far as the way that it sounded um but the way that it was received was not good he basically said he wanted to hurt himself Mm-hmm. Um, and I appreciate everybody kind of jumping in over the top, right? I got a couple of texts from parents and obviously the the coach and some other things like that. But, um, and so I, you know, I waited for me to kind of, for me to kind of analyze the whole situation, get everything from the adults. And then I just, I pulled them in, um, actually to our closet. Right. And I just, you know, we both sat down on the ground. I said, Hey, I need to talk to you about some things. You're not in trouble. Yeah. Um, and I could tell that he knew that I was serious, but he also, was he got really really emotional and i i just had to let all of that go and say okay listen what do you need right now yeah. do we need to take something off your plate do we need to pull this do we need to pull that do we need to stop this do we need to do whatever do you need help academically do you need a tutor do you, you know and, and it really comes down to time and managing time um for the for the most part right and and uh and i felt on both sides like he understood why i was so kind of like not over the top, but a little stressed out about it. Cause you know, some other kids saw it and they were kind of freaking out a little bit. Um, and then me as a parent, I had to kind of just not think about everything, anything else, but you know, his safety and stuff like that. So I think on both of our sides, uh, that's not something that happened at school. Um, I think, uh, you know, just from a small standpoint at the school at work, uh, I have, uh, an admin assistant who's amazing. And, uh, one of her kind of rules that she's figured out is I don't really ask a lot of things of her to like do things and different things like that. But it was funny because she was teaching, you know, we have this other kind of part-time aide that helps out in the office at times. And I overheard her saying, listen, he doesn't ask for very much very often, but when he asks for something that needs to go to number one on your list, because of whatever he's asking for, it may seem trivial at the moment, but it's part of a bigger plan that you don't necessarily know and he needs that information now whether it's like a report or a list of students or whatever yeah um and it was funny that she has picked up on that and i've actually never even talked to her about that but that's kind of the truth it's like hey i don't ask for a lot but when i do ask for something i need it right right then um and it was funny because something happened in in this other aid didn't follow through and my head secretary got after her about it and said, this is what happened because we didn't get this in time X, Y, and Z. You know what I mean? Um, what about you? I just talked for a long time. So it's, it's, no, it's your good. time to share. It's good. Uh, I, I learned in, in my reading, uh, a book, 
mean, you read books, right? <laughs> yeah, right. What what book was it? <laughs> um, How to Know People by David Brooks. David Brooks. I think David Brooks. Yeah. Uh, one of my all-time favorite. He talks about an acronym he uses to help remember uh, what active listening is. Because the only way you can know a person is by listening to them and hearing their story. So he talks right. about slant. So you're sitting up, you're listening, you're asking and answering questions, you nod your head, um, you're tracking the speaker. So if they're moving, where they're looking, what they're talking to, basically the active listening to show that you are actively engaged. It's not a passive thing where you're sitting back in. And even though body language, sometimes I struggle with because I feel like my body language doesn't always portray exactly what I'm thinking or feeling. It is right. important to know that what you're doing is being perceived by the other individual. And so even how I laid out my office, uh, my current office, there's, there's some restrictions I can't get around. Right. Um, but when I had my ideal office, especially as a new administrator, I took that desk and instead of having it here with the students right here, right. I turned the desk to the side. So there was no barrier between the desk um, for me and the students. And that way they could see the active listening where I could lean forward. I could sit up. I could listen. I could interact with them. I felt a little bit better uh, than having that big, bulky, huge wood desk in between us. Yeah. And the distance away. I like being able to roll my chair up right next to him just to have that chat uh, right. to feel like I, I was connecting with them a little bit better. And I, and I don't have that now. Uh, it's something I would like to change, but they had newer office furniture purchased before I got there. And it's, it's kind of out of my hands, which is I, too bad. It's interesting that you say that. Cause I think there's this, uh, there's this, th the physical space that you're in when you talk about that, it's, um, I can't remember which book it was or which presentation, but it's intentionally inviting. So sometimes at schools, we do things that are intentionally uninviting or unintentionally inviting there's that like quadrant but there's also the hard part about that right is also making an office where you can see what's happening do you know what I mean so if you have a window I, like the idea of being I hate having my back to the door yeah for sure because I think that's also intentionally like uninviting when you set up, a, at least when people walk by, you can be like, Hey, come on in, come on in, yeah. come on in. Right. So there's the, whether you have an L shaped desk or whatever, and we, you know, we'll have a conversation uh, as we do an interview, uh, hopefully in the next couple of weeks with somebody that has a mobile desk and what that looks like. But the idea of, of managing both of those together, I think is, is one of those things. So you know who I think does it really well consistently. I've seen in all my different schools, the counselors, when you walk into a counselor's office, for the most part, they take a lot of, they put a lot of thought and are very intentional about mm -hmm. what their office space looks like, whether, you know, I've seen more lamps in counselor's offices. I have seen more, um, even diffusers for smells. I have seen, um, soft colors, just they, they, they seem to be very intentional with setting up a space that is conducive to having a conversation. Uh, versus say almost anyone else that has an office where students are coming in to talk with them in a building. So I think, you know, one of the things that we're, we're talking about, right, is a physical space, but also physically, right? So I've, I've, I've got a list here, right? So what you see, right? This is nonverbal that shows that you're listening. So eye contact, focusing on the other person. You mentioned this, leaning forward a little or even nodding, right? Sitting still. Uh, letting, letting the other person finish what he or she is saying without interruption. Uh, and that's one of my difficulties because I have a, these, these kind of firing off thoughts. Uh, interested silence, giving a person time to respond. And then what you hear is, you know, some of the skills here, these are verbal, is restating what somebody says, reflecting what someone is feeling. We're asking open-ended questions like, what happened? How do you feel about that? This is what I heard. I'm hearing you say, this is what I understand that you feel, or this is what I think you mean. This is what I got from that. Um, and I mean, it, it's funny because there are points in, in times in life when you absolutely have to be 100% listening. Yeah. A few examples, getting directions from anybody. When you're helping a person or getting help, 
because you need to give them feedback on what they need help with. And if you're not listening, you know, sometimes we skip, uh, you know, skip a couple steps. Another example is learning about someone or something new. Um, and then listening to music or audiobooks for entertainment or information. It's fascinating to me that I can sit down and listen to an audiobook for six hours and really not say anything. Maybe I'll write some stuff down, but um, that's one thing that I do. It's just, this is one of my secret ninja tips is um, whenever, whenever I'm in a conversation with a parent or a student or a staff member, and I feel like the content is important i always ask them beforehand do you mind if i take notes yeah and and i and and sometimes they say well what do you, and i'm like i'll be honest with you i'm going to talk to probably 15 or 20 people today and i want to remember this conversation helping me take notes helps me remember what you're saying because i'm activating multiple parts of my brain and different parts like that if they say no then i'm like okay that's fine um, now there's a lot of AI tools that will take notes for you and do stuff like that. But I still ask if I can take notes specifically. It's the first time I'm meeting a parent or a student, or I'm gathering information on an investigation or a case or something like that. Yeah. One thing that comes up time and time again in the leadership books I read, and even in the communication books is making sure that at the end you restate or rephrase what they're saying. Um, not only because it helps you make sure you're understanding, but it, it makes them feel heard. And so that's a really key part of the active listening is at the end to say, now what you're saying is, or what I heard is, or you don't even have to preface that. You can just restate the last part of what they said, and they instantly feel heard because of it. And, and, and the other part, right, about that is if that's the end of the conversation, it really does bring kind of like a capstone to the conversation where the two of you or th whoever's been talking that you can say, yes, I've heard you. I might not have gotten every single detail, but this is what I understand about this meeting or whatever. So yeah. let's talk about, let's talk about listening, um, active listening with staff. Um, I'm going to present, or you can present, present a common scenario where active listening can impact staff interactions. So staff meetings, one-on-one -on -one sessions, you tell me. The ones that come to mind almost are the impromptu conversations that happen where a staff member might pop into your office or you might pop into their classroom or you might even run into them in the hall. And it's easy to get distracted, um, whether it's from the walkie or kids walking by or staff walking by. Uh, there, you know, there's a lot going on in school. So what can I do, you know, to really try to make sure I'm having that active listening with that staff. And sometimes it is pulling out my phone to take notes as we're talking because they're asking for something they want. X, Y, or Z, or I need to follow up on something. And so there's times where I take out my phone and I'm, I'm typing things down, but I tell them, Hey, I, I got to write this down. Otherwise I'm going to forget. So I'm just going to hurry and write this down as you're telling me. Right. Those type of things. What about you? Um, so this is kind of ninja trick. Number two is the one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, so I am in a situation where I can meet with basically every one of my staff or teachers once a month. Um, and I do, so we have it scheduled and they kind of pick, I basically give them a calendar for the whole month. We're going to do it next week when we get back from, from winter break or Christmas break, I send it out to all of them and they sign up for a time and, um, they actually run the meeting. So they create the agenda to the meeting and they bring everything that they want to talk about. And it's a 30 minute meeting and I take about five minutes at the end. And it's just a follow up on stuff from the previous meeting. I really try not to take any time in that meeting. And, and there are times when it's back and forth because we're trying to figure out a solution or, you know, we're going on a field trip, we need to get a bus or, you know, different things like that. But um, the idea for me and what's worked so well with this is every single one of my staff know that at least once a month, they have my undivided attention. Like it, it's blocked out on my calendar. So there's nothing else that happens during that time. And so there are, there are things that, uh, my teachers and staff, if we didn't have that time, would probably bring it up. But because they know they have that dedicated time, a lot of times they're like, oh, well, I'll just ask you next Tuesday in our one on one. We can talk about it then. So what that does is it funnels all of the questions and concerns or problems or whatever for that individual person into a block of time. Now, this is not to say that I ignore them if they have something important to talk about. But most people know that when you have a scheduled time, 
to communicate with your direct supervisor or, you know, your supervisor above, right? Um, you save things for that time. And I actually have conversations with my direct supervisor as well, once a month for an hour. And, you know, that's kind of a split agenda. He sends a list of things that he for sure wants to talk about. And then I send him a list of things that we want to talk about. We hammer those things out. Sometimes it's longer than an hour and a half. But I, if you're in a situation where you could do that and it takes time and it takes training, but you could even funnel that down through your assistant principals and your department heads where every single person in your building is, is having, you know, 30 minute meetings once a month, the way information flows up and down just is super amazing. I, I've thought about what that would look like at a high school when you have, you know, 85 teachers, you know, and 50 staff. You would definitely have to go through some training and have other people on board, like department heads or split departments in half. But um, I highly, highly recommend to do that. If not with your entire staff, at least your leadership team of your building or grade level teams, uh, if you're in elementary school, to to find out what's really happening, you're gonna get you're gonna get a lot of that. And I take notes on those every time. Yeah, someday we're gonna have to go into your note taking, what that looks like. Yeah. Um, so the benefits of this are better team cohesion, problem solving, and morale. Are there any other benefits to active listening that you can think of? Well, I can think of some staff? opposites where I've seen what happens when leadership, one doesn't listen, but definitely doesn't do active listening. I, I've worked with some leaders before that as you're trying to have a conversation with them, they are actively on their computer typing and writing, even though you might be the only one in the room in their office um, and, and it's an L shape and you might be sitting here, but they're sitting here, but looking at their computer. And so it, it's a really easy way to make someone feel less than or inferior. So do you have the personality where you would say something like, Hey, listen, this is a, this is a serious conversation. I need you really to pay attention. Um, I think I, I didn't say anything then. And it was in part because of the person it was. Uh, I, I know it wouldn't have been well-received. And so I, I just, I didn't say anything at all. I should have, but I didn't. And I know it's something that they've done for almost 30 years now. And it's something they're known for. So it, maybe it's the wrong attitude, but I was like, old dog ain't learning new tricks. Right. I mean, I mean, this is, this is the radical candor coming in, right? This is the like, Hey, I'm, I'm, let's have a conversation. If you, and, and I'm not judging you at all because I've been in the situation too, where I didn't say anything either. And then that person thinks that their behavior is okay or even actually appropriate. And then it just goes on long enough that nobody ever says anything. And so they just keep, you know, eating the soup that's super salty or whatever. Anyway, uh, I can't remember if that's the story or not, but so we'll talk about because there's some challenges with active listening. We'll talk about that. So jumping in with students, I think this is something that administrators are a lot better at than uh, than with staff, just from my personal experience and what I see other people. So um, one of the things that I think really, really helps with active listening for students is trying. It's hard to do, but trying to understand the student's perspective. Yeah. You know, they're a 12, 5, 7, 18, 17 year old student who made a mistake generally, right? Sometimes it's flat out. They know exactly what they're doing and they meant to harm somebody and whatever. But I think most things that happen are mistakes or in the heat of the moment kind of decisions. Yeah. They're not planned out. Um, but um, what does active listening, you mentioned a little bit about leaning in and kind of getting close and like doing that. What are, some examples of active listening with students the biggest thing for me and the thing i've the thing I, I pride myself in the most maybe not the most but something i pride myself in is when i talk with students uh, i really try to treat them like adults no matter their age and so i try to talk to them on a on the same level uh not talking down to them 
Uh, and that's something I've gotten feedback on is the kid does appreciate that I talk to them as if they're an adult. Uh, I mean, there, there, it's time and place. There's times where you have to handle a little bit different. But for the most part, even when they are in the middle of full meltdown mode and or full jerk mode, you know, in my office and and saying anything and everything to get a rise or a reaction out of me, I feel like as I'm listening to them and treating them like adult, it kind of cuts through a lot of that crap. And so then they realize, oh, maybe I can't get away with the crap I'm trying to do. Uh, maybe I need to have more of a, a real conversation with him. And I find that that's one thing that really, I think, makes a big difference. Also, even with parents, is to ask them flat out, especially at the beginning of the conversation, what are you looking to get out of this conversation? What are you coming into my office uh, looking for? Because typically a parent and or students coming in with, with a desire with a need, with something that they want changed or remediated or fixed or improved. And what can I do, uh, you know, from my side? Because then if, if we can clarify that to begin with, then I think that is what's helping with the active listening. Because oftentimes people are going to beat around the bush, beat around the bush. And it's hard for me to stay engaged when I can tell they're just beating around the bush. Right. Just, just get to it. Cut through it. Like, what are you looking to do? Um, you know, I'm, I'm glad you're here advocating for your kid. That's your job. I appreciate it. Um, know that I want to do everything I can for your child. Might not be able to, what are you looking for? I think that's good. I mean, that's, that's my third kind of ninja thing that I would say is if somebody comes, if, if somebody's coming into my office, right, this isn't me pulling them down and I'm, and I'm talking to them. Mm -hmm. Uh, one of the things that I generally ask is I'm like, okay, I, it, it sounds like you're going to tell me something. Um, what, what do you need out of this conversation? Right. Yeah, do you want me sure. to, do you want me to solve this problem for you? Do you want me to help you solve the problem? Do you want me to help you come up with some ideas to solve the problem? Do you want my advice or do you just want me to listen? You know, and you could, you could say, do you just want me to listen? Do you want me to solve the problem or do you want me to help you solve the problem? Yeah. So then I think if it's like, you know, I just want you to listen. And then that's your clear message right there that you need to throw on your active listening, all your skill set, and you don't have to say anything at the end. But if they say, yeah, I think I need your advice, then you've got to throw on your active listening and the thought process at the end to help them come up with a solution. And then I feel like if they say, oh, well, I need you to help me solve this problem, then that's more of a back and forth. Like we're both engaged in solving this problem. Yeah. And there's probably other things that go along with that. But that's one of the things that I do when somebody comes to me. Um, as I ask them those three things, do you want advice? Do you want me to solve the problem or do you want me just to listen? And I, and that goes a long way, uh, when people bring up stuff. So I think one of the other big things as far as, um, student well-being and engagement and different things like that is actually helping students teach students specifically how to be active listeners. And I remember as a, as a, as a teacher, we had a Socratic seminar kind of inside outside circle. And it was a great opportunity for me as a teacher to teach the kids, like you're following the actual conversation. You don't need to say anything. And if you actually say something from the outside circle, you lose points. Right. And if you've done a Socratic seminar, you know what I'm talking about. If you haven't, there's a great thing on uh, I can't remember the edutopia, I think where it talks about um, Socratic seminars, but so um, the challenges. So you mentioned one. Um, is the identifying typical obstacles, uh, which are basically preconceived notions, distractions, and we talked about time constraints. I think time constraints is the easiest one because you can lay that out right at the beginning, right? You can say, hey, listen, I do have another meeting in 15 minutes. Once this goes to about 10, 12 minutes, I may have you come back in and reschedule this meeting because I've got to get to this other thing that's scheduled. And I think that when you say that to people, especially if they don't have an appointment or anything like that, and I'm not saying that all parents need to have appointments, but if you have a parent that just pops in and you're like, hey, listen, I have another meeting to be to in 10 minutes. Can I give you eight minutes now? And then maybe we can schedule time for tomorrow or the next day. The two that I think are a little bit more difficult are controlling distractions, especially in a school, and then preconceived notions. How do you handle both of those? Uh, with distractions, if it's a serious conversation, if I know it's going to be a biggie, you know, I shut the door and most people know that if a door's shut, 
the you don't bug unless there's a pretty big situation happening and so for the most part those situations with the door closed you know the distractions typically are minimized and having multiple administrators in a high school setting it makes it easier because if something comes up for the most part depends on your team you know someone else is going to pick it up because they know uh Stuart's in with you know a parent that's pretty upset i'm going to pick up if a student comes down asking for you know a class drop form or something signed right Uh, um also something that's helped even with the preconceived notions is in the big situations i'll typically have another administrator in there with me uh, just to have another adult present at times but what's been good is if you have the the right relationship with that other administrator afterwards you can you can sit and dissect that conversation you can even just get feedback from them like yo you know vi how did that go what did i do well what did i mess up what did you think about that? You know, what what about this part? Uh, and, and it's helpful because especially if you can have people in there that um, have different perspectives on life than you, they're going to be able to help you understand, hey, you know, maybe this, you know, isn't cool to say or, or whatever it is. I, I found having another adult, trusted adult in there with me has made a big difference. I think one of the things that you just mentioned is huge uh, talking about continuous improvement. I think I, it, part of this I didn't realize until I got married and then got into education before it was it was different because I was kind of like the boss or whatever. But th- this idea of analyzing or looking at a conversation and then saying, did that go did that go the way did that conversation go the way that I thought it would go, want it to go or did it go completely in the wrong direction? And why was it? And and I don't think that happened until. Um, you know, I had a, I mean, part of it again is being married, right. And having just conversations with your spouse or partner and, and kind of going through that. But I remember one time I kind of totally threw a kid under a bus in front of his family and it was his first big family meeting and he didn't know about it. And I remember he blew up at me probably about a week and a half later, I pulled him back down to my office. And I realized that point as an adult that I actually never included him in any part of the conversation. I had his parents show up. He didn't know. He got pulled down to the office. He thought he was something else was happening. And we basically had this huge intervention about his behavior. And uh, and I appreciate that he had. And this is the part that we talked about with radical candor. Right. I appreciate that he told me how it made him feel after the fact. If he had never said that, I just thought it was totally okay. But I never really did that again. I never really threw a student under the bus. Like, and, and I don't mean under the bus. That's not what I mean, but like totally surprised him and caught him off guard. I would always say, listen, we're going to call your parents. We're going to have them come in. We're going to have a conversation. Right. Um, I think the more that you can inform people of what's happening or what's going on. Um, and I, I really do think the hard, the hardest ones are the assumptions, the preconceived notions where parents come in. And, and I think like you said at the very beginning, you can actually squash all the preconceived notions if you just say, listen, you know, what what do you want? If you had a magic wand and you could make whatever you wanted happen today, what would that be? I'm not saying that I can do that, but just tell me right at the beginning what you want. And then I think that just completely diffuses the parents that are coming in like to battle. I mean, they still might be upset, but they're not coming into battle. And I think with staff as well, you know, I think about all the times that we've done, you know, teacher evaluations and they come into that final meeting, they're worried because they haven't seen their score, or they haven't done whatever. You just lay it on and say, hey, just so you know, you're effective or highly effective or whatever. Um, let's talk about what I saw that was really, really good. And this is what I thought maybe needed improvement. Yeah. Well, so, that's that's my ninja skill. I'm sure I'm going to bring up constantly throughout lots. Something I learned early on working with a lot of difficult parents was if you thank them for coming in and advocating for their kid and fighting for their kid and being that person and acknowledging that it is their job to do that, that usually diffuses a lot of that anger as well and, and allows them to actually get to a place where maybe they can actively listen as well because they don't feel like they have to fight as much. You know, I appreciate you coming in. I know you have to fight for Jimmy. That's your job as his mom. And, and I love that you're in here doing it. Please know that I want what's good for him too. And I'll do everything in my power. It might not be exactly what you're looking for, but let's figure out what we can do to help them. 
So I think one of the cool things, it's, it's kind of a challenge, right, that we'll throw out there. Um, if you're a teacher, administrator, you work in a building here, you know, you could do a mini PD on this, right? Um, you could basically divide your staff into two and have them all talk to each other for four or five minutes. And then you could ask them some of the following questions. Um, how did you know that this person was listening to you? Uh, what did it feel like to be listened to without being interrupted? What made this activity challenging for you? How can active listening help you resolve conflicts? That's something that you could literally do in a PD for 10 minutes, dividing your whole staff, putting them together, having them talk, and you can create whatever questions you want. It doesn't really matter what those questions are because the skill is really about the active listening. It's not about what the conversation is about. Um, but I think you really get a good idea of in, you know, um, faculty meetings, leadership teams, even admin teams, who the active listeners are, who the good listeners are. And I think you and I are both, you know, we've talked about some people that we respect because it feels like you're always the number one person when they're talking to you. And one of them is your former principal who now works at the district level, I think. Definitely. Um, um, and it's the same one I'm talking about. Um, she used to be in charge of language arts. I said that one. That one. Okay. Nice. I like that you have that in your house. <laughs> so, um, Okay. And for those of you listening to the podcast, sorry, that was a video only moment. You're going to have to go to YouTube, yeah. find it. Yeah. You'll have to go to YouTube, find it. See what I have in my house. Cause it's a doozy. Okay. Final thoughts. What do you got? I've already shared mine. Yeah. So to recap, my big takeaway is, uh, cause I I've, I've heard about it so much in so many books that I respect and from people I respect is at the end, give that restater recap when they're talking to them. That way they know that you're listening and that, you know, you're listening. Um, listening for that recap and that restatement. That's my big one. Right? Yeah. yeah. Good. Okay. So oh. next week, our next leadership episode, we're going to be talking about feedback, different parts of feedback. We're going to be diving into it. Uh, it's going to be a fun one because we, we've got some feedback examples to give to you. Wow. Make sure you put on your sunscreen because baby, they burn. There are some good burns in there. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. So tune in next week, next month, next year. We just want you here because it might be next year. We're here at the end of December. We only got a few more days left. And people have been asking what they can do to help. The biggest thing you can do to help is leave us a five-star review on whatever you're listening, whatever Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Overlook, Outlook, whatever look it is. <laughs> I can't remember. Uh, leave us a five-star review there. We really appreciate it. But signing off, I'm Stuart Hudnall. And I'm Spencer Campbell. This is School Story. Have a good one.